I would like to personally welcome you to Faith and Hope for Today. We are here to bring you the clear word of God to strengthen your faith in the challenging time we live. We know that your faith produces hope and that God will take you through anything. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you are near. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me Well, it's great again to be back. Uh, we've got another, I hope, challenging and very interesting presentation. We are doing a series on the coming apocalypse, and we're looking at it through the New Testament from the book of Matthew. We are looking at the words of Jesus himself. So uh, nobody knows better than Jesus, so I, I hope that the words he shares and speaks that are recorded for us today will illuminate thoughts and, and your mind to find joy in his redemption. Faith and Hope for today, our title, Oil in Reserve. That's the question. I should have put a question mark there. Do you have oil in reserve? Now we're into Matthew 25. We just finished last week, Matthew 24. This is part five in this series. So I just want you to... Hang on, because now Jesus is going to take us into a whole new dimension of what it looks like in preparing for his coming. In this case, the church. The church's preparation. So, let's begin. Then the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, I want to say this, that the normal scene is when Jesus is using a parable, it is something they have probably just recently seen. In other words, it's very likely that a wedding party had just gone by somewhere, they had just seen it, and Jesus is going to pull out of something that's fresh in the minds of his disciples an illustration. He does this so many times. So here we have the ten virgins and a wedding for the background. Now maidens represent the church actively waiting for Christ the groom. And this story would take place with the ten virgins very close, very near to the bride's home where the groom is going to come and receive his bride. And I hope you find that to be very simple. In verse 2 of Matthew 25, Matthew recorded these words. Five of these maidens, these young women, were foolish, and five were wise. So we're about to discover what is the difference. So I want to say the number five has no prophetic significance. It is just a portion of the group. He could have said three, he could have said seven, he said five. I also want to say that the foolish are not hypocrites. They're simply lacking something that will unfold in the story. They are all attracted to the gospel, including the five foolish. But they are still holding on to their human efforts. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So here's verse 3. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. You see, they love this theory of the gospel. But it has no effect on them without oil. Now I'm going to explain that in detail, but listen carefully. If oil is representative of the Holy Spirit empowering the gospel message of the church, without oil there is no power 
to make proclamation of the good news. Is it possible to love the theory of the gospel but not allow it to have an impact on your life to help you understand your need of the ongoing daily experience of the Holy Spirit? Notice what Zechariah says about the Holy Spirit here. Zechariah 4, 1-7. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, with each seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Zechariah says, I saw also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and one on the left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then the angel said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of the hosts. So that oil coming from the olive trees into the lamp to illuminate the message would be the power of the Holy Spirit here in the Old Testament. Not by human might, not by human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 4 of Matthew 25. But the wise maidens took oil in flasks along with their lamps. They are in possession of the oil of gladness. They are in possession of the Holy Spirit to illuminate the way into eternity with the groom and the bride when they meet. Now, this is the distinguishing difference between the wise and the foolish. The foolish do not have extra oil, but the wise have oil flasks. So when their lamps are low, they may add oil so that the message of let's go meet the groom when he welcomes the bride can be illuminated and everyone can follow them. Now, if this is a prophetic picture of the contemporary church today, you do realize the implication here. It is possible that some churches are void and without the oil of the Holy Spirit. I'm not labeling, I'm not naming, I'm not asking you to look around at which churches do or don't. That is not the point. We'll dig deeper into this understanding as we proceed but notice what Jesus is saying about the church today. Do you have extra oil is the important question. John 14, 16 to 17 reads this way. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. A gift from Jesus to you. Do you have possession of that precious gift of the Holy Spirit? That is an important question. In verse 7, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, cannot come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world, and here's the message, concerning sin. Convict the world of righteousness. Convict the world of judgment. And then Jesus says in verse 9, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Isn't that interesting? And concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me because he gives us the gift of his righteousness when he arrives. And concerning judgment because the ruler 
of this world has been judged. Verse 12, Jesus says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Five of those maidens have the oil, the spirit of truth. Five have neglected to have oil in reserve for the spirit of truth, which means that they may not have the truth of Jesus Christ for the last days. This is a profound conversation. This is an important passage. It says, continuing in John 16, verse 13, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he who takes of mine will disclose it to you. We have that presence of the Holy Spirit gifted to us from Christ that it will empower us to make proclamation of the last message to lighten the word world with the glory of God. Now back to Matthew 25, verse 5. Now while the bridegroom was taking longer than they expected, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Now, Jesus comes at just the right time. Maybe you don't agree with that, but it really isn't up to you and me to decide that. But how do we explain this verse? How do we explain this reality that the entire Christian church falls into a drowsiness, a slumbering? That we're preoccupied with ourselves. That we're groggy and slow and we're not being about the Lord's business. What does that mean? That we all slumber. I don't know which church you go to. But have you ever asked your question, yourself a question when you look around? Are we really awake in this church? Are we really on fire? Are we really empowered to make proclamation? Get ready, get ready, get ready? Or are we just barely making it through the service today? It's an important question to answer. It must be answered for every single church throughout the planet, throughout this world. Are we slumbering or are we awake? Because Jesus tells us that we're going to enter into this period of time. But then there's verse 6. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. You see, midnight is the darkest hour of a 24-hour day. And Jesus says that the midnight cry was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom will come to meet him. So that means the bridegroom is now, we are fully aware of his coming presence and we are inviting everyone to come to the wedding party. And now these ten maidens are going to come into full ministry to lead everyone to this joyous wedding. Midnight is the darkest hour. We will wake up. Jesus said so. But we are not all the same as churches, are we? Some have oil and some don't. Some have illumination to truth and some do not. That is an important parable. It says in verse 7, Then all the virgin, virgins rose up and trimmed their lamps. All ten wake up. All ten see the signs. All ten trim the lights, the wicks. You've got to get that little bit of charcoal off so your flame is brighter and taller. All ten are ready to lead the way to the groom's home, to the wedding feast. Wow. Isn't that just exciting? All ten are ready to go. So when we talk about being ready for the apocalypse, Jesus said there is going to be a great awakening. Wake up at the darkest hour. It's time for everyone 
to get ready to head out for the wedding feast. Now we get to the serious part of this parable. The foolish maidens said to the prudent, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Now obviously we know that they are not carrying their flasks or we would have been told. Jesus is saying that these five foolish maidens did not bring extra oil. And the implications now are profoundly serious for every single church. No oil? Running out of oil? Oil of the Holy Spirit is needed to empower the gospel message. No oil would mean no message. No message would mean they lack the message to go to the world. They have something else. But it isn't the message God said will take you into eternity. This is an intense parable. This is not kindergarten stuff. I mean, it's like at least fifth grade. If we could just be as smart as a fifth grader, well, that's another story. What is it that they have if they don't have oil? Ask yourself that. But the wise answered, No, there will be not enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. Listen carefully. You cannot transfer the Holy Spirit in you to another human being. You have either welcomed it and received the spirit of truth, you have either integrated that into your spiritual experience, or you have not. What is the truth of yourself? What is your integrity with God like? If you can't receive the Holy Spirit from some family member or some church member, do you take time every day to be filled with the Spirit of Truth? Because I'm going to tell you, when you have the Spirit of Truth, it illuminates the Word of God. It illuminates the message to lighten the earth with His glory for the last days. But if you do not have it, your light goes out and you stumble in the darkness trying to find your way to get some oil. This is an intense parable. The superficial gospel. I want to explain to you what the gospel is without the Holy Spirit. It is part human effort and part divine gift. It is trying to integrate your humanity, the truth of your sinful nature with the divine gift and then make a message that has power. But if you are included in your human effort, your nature is naturally selfish and selfishness gets embedded into the message and it becomes all about you. Supplementing Jesus' work of saving us with our humanity is not a compatible thing with the gospel. Here's why. Jesus has done all the saving. We accept this free gift by faith in him. We are in need of the oil to make proclamation with power and strength. I cannot tell you how many churches teach, well, you're already partially good, and God just comes down and meets your good and then takes you the rest of the way. But I want to tell you that that is the very foundation of pagan religion from Greco-Roman pagan. I mean, they had to take the good in them and then work hard to appease all of their angry gods. And when Christians believe that they have the good in them and they have to please the creator of the universe, that he may come down and meet them and finish the work of salvation, then they have to have claimed some form of holiness or divinity equal to God in order for God to connect with their goodness. And folks, we just don't have it. Nowhere in scripture does it say that you're full of divine goodness, qualified to meet God's goodness and finish the work. We are in need of Jesus by faith alone entirely. 
In Matthew 25, verse 10, it reads this. While we were going away to make, while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. What I, I, I just want to pause and just challenge you for just a moment here. It, it says in the slide, what you believe makes all the difference in eternal things. Our challenge as human beings is to get ourselves out of the way so that Christ is free to make us into the men and women he called us to be. In Matthew 25, verse 11, it reads, Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Now, that's an incredibly sad story because they're saying we did it our way theology and it excludes you from the wedding feast. You realize only you can keep yourself out of the wedding feast. If Jesus has done all of the saving and you accept that by faith alone completely, like Paul said, it's no longer I who live, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ lives in me then Christ is doing it his way, not you trying to do it your way. Because they're pounding on the door saying, Lord, open up for us. And of course you, oh, sure, he's going to go open the door and let him in? That's not what the Bible says. It says in verse 12, listen carefully, do not miss this. He answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. This hybrid gospel of my goodness meeting God's goodness excludes Jesus Christ from the heart because if you think you're already that good, you don't need Jesus. More than that, in this parable, Jesus says that he doesn't even recognize you when you come knocking on the door. You've never met him because you are full of yourself. It is possible for a Christian to alienate Christ because that is what our selfishness always does. Thank God I am not like other people is a selfish statement. It is the exact opposite of gospel language, the saving language of Jesus Christ. Let me read some things that are, I think, really relevant at this time. Romans 5, 6 to 11, listen to what it says. Think about your nature. Think about whatever goodness you think you have. For while we were still helpless, doesn't say while we were still in our goodness. It says while we were still helpless at the right time. Christ died for all the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps the good man someone would dare to die. Even to die. But God and this is the punchline here. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, inadequate, incomplete, in rebellion, in our worst, if you would, Christ died for us. Then Paul says this, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. The judgment of we're saved by Jesus Christ. And that wrath is not directed towards men. It is directed towards sin. The destruction of sin in the universe. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies. Doesn't sound like a bunch of good people meeting the goodness of God, does it? For if while we were enemies, 
we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. As I have said over and over, he has done all of the saving. We are the recipients of his completed salvation. And folks, that ought to be the best news in the entire world. It should just thrill us right down to the very core of our being. Because what Paul is saying is that why we were in rebellion, why we were sinners, why we were enemies of God, God did not wait for you to discover the good in you. He did it while we as human beings were at our worst. So we have no claim to say I was good enough that God met my goodness and saved me. We only have one claim that while I was in rebellion, while I was a sinner, while I was a re uh, an enemy of God, if you would, Christ died for me, took me into himself, and paid in full my rebellion to the Father. Best news in the whole world, isn't it? Matthew 25, verse 13, the end of the parable. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. You do not know the day or the hour. The clock is ticking. It is moving. We are watching things happen on this planet. I mean, I never thought in my lifetime I would hear over and over, various leaders and people in positions of power and authority that are saying things like, well, World War III has started and World War III is already in motion. and World War III is going to happen possibly in three to five years. I, I never heard things like that, ever. But the nature of man is on a war path. Violence, corruption, Lying, cheating, stealing. And I'm talking about the leaders of corporations and nations. And what does Jesus say? Be on the alert then. You do not know the day nor the hour. Be ready. I want to take us to our closing picture. Thank you, Sherry, for that beautiful pond. One of those lovely pictures that come to us from Wyoming just one of those great places to be so thank you Sherry. I hope you've been blessed with our study today. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries PO Box 5622 Twin Falls Idaho 83303